Keep this date fresh in your mind. The 2nd of December, 2010. On that day, FIFA, the international federation of the most influential sport in the world, awarded Qatar the hosting of the 2022 World Cup. A decision that, for Qatar, one of the richest countries in the world, meant launching one of the largest investment plans in history. We are talking about, hold on to your chair, almost 200 billion dollars. And yes, you heard correctly, we didn't add any zeros. 200 billion. Obviously, not all of this enormous sum of money is directly related to the World Cup. Rather, this event has been the perfect excuse for the Qatari government to push ahead with a huge plan to modernize the Emirate. So we are not just talking about modern football stadiums on which the Qatari government is going to spend some $6 billion, but also new highways, railway lines, a new 186 mile or 300 kilometer metro network at a cost of almost $40 billion, on the expansion of Hamad Airport into one of the most modern, largest and luxurious airports in the world. In other words, the 2022 World Cup has become, in the government's eyes, a kind of turning point for a new era of modernity and prosperity. The perfect icing on the cake for an economy that has grown almost tenfold since the turn of the century, making this small emirate one of the richest countries in the world. However, hold on a minute, visual politic fans, because not everything is so idyllic. All kinds of suspicions and a huge wave of criticism have also arisen around this World Cup. So much that many international organisations have come to call it the World Cup of Shame. Something that has caused us here at Visual Politic to ask ourselves a few questions. Why on earth is Qatar so keen to host a World Cup? And why does it consider it such a big deal? What's behind all the suspicions surrounding it? What's the reason? Stay tuned, because in this video we are going to answer all of these questions. So let's get cracking. <laughs> The power of sport. Let's not fool ourselves. Things have improved tremendously, perhaps much more than we'd have been able to imagine just a few years ago. The truth is that, despite this, the countries of the Persian Gulf remain very rigid tyrannies, with a lot of restrictions on the most basic of human rights. And you know what? Seen from this perspective, what is known as sports diplomacy has become a pillar of the political strategy for each of these countries, for four fundamental reasons. Firstly, because in the face of so many restrictions on women, the LGBTQ population, many immigrants, or simply in the face of potentially rebellious journalists, Sport allows these countries to sell a completely different image. An image of modernity, competition, success. All positive attributes. It is what is known as sport washing. Exactly what many companies do with the environment, but using sports competitions instead of the environment. <laughs> Secondly, because thanks to sport, these countries can achieve much more international prominence, be better known and have more influence. Think, for example, precisely of the case of Qatar, a country that has been living in fear of a Saudi invasion for years. If you regularly watch visual politic, and why wouldn't you, we're great, you probably already know that both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates don't get along particularly well with Qatar. And obviously, the better known a country is, the better its international image, and the more influence it achieves, the more difficult it will be for another country to take it by force. It is something similar to what many Russian oligarchs did for many years to protect themselves from the fury of the Kremlin. The better known they were, the harder it would be to put them in the crosshairs. Thirdly, because you all know, the countries of the Persian Gulf are very, very dependent on the exploitation of oil or natural gas. That's precisely why they've been trying to diversify their economies for years. Well, sport can play a very important role here, both to promote tourism and for the development of other activities. There are, for example, the case of Spian Sports or Abu Dhabi Sports, two large television production and broadcasting platforms that are developing a whole new industry of sports journalists, analysts, programmers, and advertising experts. In the case of BN Sports, for example, it owns a whole lot of television rights to many of the biggest competitions in the world. And fourth, what the hell? Because they can afford it. After all, if you have literal mountains of money, you want to use it for something, right? For example, to be the main player in the biggest events. Well, the fact is that, for all these reasons, the countries of the Persian Gulf have been betting heavily on sport in recent years. They are creating national sports leagues, training centres, they are attracting athletes and sports professionals from all corners of the world, organising major international sporting events, and they're even buying some of the world's best known teams. We are talking about cases such as Paris Saint-Germain, Manchester City, New York City FC, the repeated attempts to buy Manchester United, or the latest acquisition of the Saudi government. 
Saudi Newcastle soccer takeover prompts sport washing concerns. Saudi Arabia is the latest petro state to buy up a Western sporting franchise, in what experts say is an attempt to boost its image abroad. However, all of the petro monarchies in the Persian Gulf, the one that has gone much further in this matter is precisely Qatar. Because when it comes to the sports industry, believe me when I say that Qatar plays in a different league. Check this out. Qatar's Big Signings With a population of just 350,000 Qataris and 2 million immigrants, Qatar, a small peninsula in the Middle East, is a very, very wealthy country. This is particularly thanks to being the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. However, the country has been trying to diversify its economy for years. And precisely to achieve this, in 2008, they launched their Vision 2030, a strategy, a plan to turn Qatar into a developed and competitive country beyond hydrocarbons. Well, in this strategy, sport and, in particular, the king of sports, football, were prominent elements of this modernization plan. The aim was that sports, and particularly football, would boost tourism, Qatar's image in the world, and also its political influence. In other words, they wanted to turn football into a gigantic advertising campaign. In order to achieve this, in 2011, the Qatari government bought PSG, the biggest football club in France. Of course, the arrival of the new owners was accompanied by a huge influx of money. And with it came a host of stars such as Ibrahimovic, Beckham, Neymar, Mbappe, Di Maria, Ramos, and Lionel Messi himself. In fact, the two most extensive signings in the history of football were made by this team. I'm talking about the 252 million signing of Neymar and the 204 million arrival of Mbappe. All so that PSG could be a real showcase for the country and its revitalized football industry. For example, the PSG president was, in turn, appointed president of the European Club Association, a position that also placed him directly on the UEFA Executive Council. A more than influential position when it comes to, for example, encouraging many big teams to spend training periods in the Emirate. But that's not all. In addition, over the years they have also developed their own national league because that was essentially the idea for world famous stars to live in Qatar and become true ambassadors for the country. Xavi Hernandez. The criticism of Qatar is unfounded. It's a generous and hospitable country. David Beckham signs a 150 million pound deal to be an ambassador for Qatar. But the biggest challenge came in 2010 with the awarding of the hosting of the 2022 World Cup. The sheikhs of Qatar had the strategy very clear. This was the year, the perfect moment to show the world the best image of a modern, developed and prosperous country. Think about it. What better showcase than to have the whole world watching? Well, you know what? No sooner said than done. Since 2010, they have been executing a huge investment plan of almost $200 billion that has completely transformed the Emirate. The metro, the airport, new highways, thousands of new hotel rooms, promenades, even a new island city, Lusadil, located about 9 miles or 15 kilometers from Doha. A city that will have marinas, residential areas, shopping malls, luxury shops, beaches and two golf courses. It's part of a final phase of the World Cup and for at least 10 years the Qatar Formula One Grand Prix will be held there. And, of course, among the projects that have gone ahead are some of the most modern stadiums in the world, including the first air-conditioned stadium and the first demountable stadium. 2022 is the year chosen for its launch. However, visual politic fans, things have become somewhat complicated to the extent that the Emirates shot could backfire. Or at least the World Cup might be slightly less glitzy than expected. Why? Check this out. A World Cup under suspicion. When you think about it, Qatar is perhaps one of the worst possible destinations to host a World Cup or any other major international competition. Because while it is true the country has made a lot of progress and, in many areas, it is almost a role model, as far as winning an international bid to host what is perhaps the most important sporting competition in the world? And, let's see, despite the great improvements that have taken place, we are talking about a country with a very harsh climatic conditions, with a poor record of respect for human rights, where the media is not entirely free, where homosexuality is criminalised, and where women are not fully equal in rights to men. To make matters worse, in November 2010, a FIFA technical report stated that Qatar was the only candidate that presented high operational risks as a host. Among other factors, this was because the infrastructure was not yet in place. 
So of course, if you take all these things into account and you consider that the rivals were strong candidates such as Japan, the USA, South Korea and New Zealand, then what can I say? It's strange that Qatar was chosen. Don't you agree? Choosing Qatar's bid even meant turning the entire world football calendar upside down. Why? Well, because given the extremely harsh weather conditions, very hot and very humid, the World Cup will have to be held during the months of November and December, which means a complete interruption of a calendar of the world's most important leagues. La Liga, the Premier League, Serie A, the Bundesliga, etc, etc, etc. So then, why exactly did they choose Qatar? Well, let's just say that since the announcement, a lot of theories, or rather, a lot of pieces of evidence, have emerged. Blatter and Platini face fraud charges in FIFA corruption probe. The former world and European football chiefs accused by Swiss authorities of receiving a $2 million bribe. Since the awarding of the World Cup to Qatar, a lot of evidence and witness accounts have emerged pointing to massive corruption in the election process. For example, a whistleblower framed Cameroon's Issa Hayatu and Ivorian Jacuz Altoma for receiving $1.5 million in exchange for a vote for Qatar. Then, Mohammed bin Hammam, president of the Asian Football Confederation, and a strong candidate for the FIFA presidency was accused of bribing 25 officials to vote for Qatar. And in fact, after these revelations, he was banned for life. And these are just two examples. In 2012, in light of all the scandals that were emerging, Michael Garcia, a former New York lawyer and judge who chaired FIFA's ethics committee, investigated FIFA for alleged corruption. For two years, he conducted an exhaustive investigation from which the 350-page findings became known as the Garcia Report. FIFA decided to put the report in a drawer and publish only a summary that did not incriminate anyone. protest, Michael Garcia resigned from his position. And do you know what? When the report was leaked years later, it said such obvious things as that the members of the executive committee studying the negative aspects of Qatar's bid didn't even include the harsh weather conditions or the disruption it would cause to the world football calendar. Nothing at all. Qatar had to win at all costs. So, after a myriad of allegations, including the FBI's arrests in 2015 of 11 officials accused of corruption and who had participated in the vote supporting Qatar, I think we can all get an idea of the motives that really made this emirate the winner. What's more, in 2019, it was discovered that Al Jazeera had offered $400 million in exchange for securing the TV rights to the tournament, including an additional $100 million if Qatar won the bid. Well, what can I say? FIFA is just kind of like that. But this is not the only dodgy aspect surrounding the World Cup in Qatar. The harsh conditions faced by low-cost migrants arriving in Qatar to work have been another major source of controversy. You see, more than 6,500 migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have died in Qatar since the Emirate won the right to host the World Cup 10 years years ago. The vast majority of them did not die on stadium construction sites, but presumably did die on infrastructure work associated with the World Cup in Qatar. The sweltering heat, the lack of safety measures, or the kafala system, now fortunately no longer in use, which turned workers from poor countries into virtual slaves, were surely major causes of all these tragedies. For those of you who don't know it, the kafala system is where the employer is legally responsible for the worker, so that even to leave the country, you need the approval of the boss. And of course, this means that workers cannot complain or change jobs. In any case, returning to the 6,500 fatalities, it is clear that these are appalling figures for such a wealthy country, but they have not shocked their countries of origin. Why? Well, because according to data from the Indian government, occupational mortality in this country is much higher than in Qatar. Be that as it may, from such a rich gas power as Qatari Emirate, one would expect something different. So all this high labour mortality, along with the terrible living conditions and the very long working hours of these workers have made many international organisations denounce this World Cup as the World Cup of shame. Fortunately, all these criticisms led Qatar to change its entire labour regulations from top to bottom. It adopted welfare standards and put an end to the perverse kafala system. Well, I guess that's the upside of the World Cup concession. In any case, we need to be careful with the negative news because, well, let's just say that there was a media war between the governments of Qatar and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And of course, damaging the World Cup is seen by the Qatari bet as the biggest blow that this emirate can receive today. So visual politic fans, these are the reasons that have made Qatar the most expensive World Cup of all time, and also the suspicions and criticisms that have clouded the good image that the emirate hoped to achieve. Having said that, who do you think will be the winner of this World Cup? Will things go as well for Qatar's interests as it government's hopes? Leave your answers below in the comments. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politics. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.